Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. It is very clear in the Word of God that truth is an important concept. We read that the truth will set us free. We see that it's written upon the thigh of Messiah when he returns that he is the truthful one. That word truthful and faithful are interchangeable in the biblical language. We see the truth when we walk in it and speak in it. It will bring us greater intimacy with God. It will also position us where we can receive revelation from God. Whenever we distort the truth, whenever we misrepresent something, we are not behaving under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, but we are behaving like the father of all lies, and that is Satan. So let me ask you a question. Do you walk and speak the truth of God? Are you someone that is very sensitive to make sure that your words, that is what you convey to others, they are accurate? When we deceive, when we distort, when we misrepresent, we are under the influence of the enemy. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Acts in chapter 5. The book of Acts in chapter 5. Now, here we're going to encounter a couple, a man and a woman within a covenantal relationship, husband and wife. And we know biblically that the woman is the man's helpmate. That is, that God has graciously equipped the woman to assist her husband, but here's the key, in the things of God, not in what he desires. That is to say that a man is not called to rule over his wife under some false authority, but rather he has authority in regard to leading the family in the will of God. And she is an integral part of him hearing from God, her counseling him, working together in order that God might be glorified. But what happens when a man, a husband, isn't interested in doing that which is right, living according to the truth? Then should a woman submit to that? And the answer is no, she should not. If she does, well, the consequences are going to be disastrous for him and for her. So in this fifth chapter... One of the things that's being emphasized is the apostolic authority. That is, that God has raised up men in order to lead the ministry of Messiah. And one of the truths that we find in the book of Acts is that God is showing their authority through signs and wonders. The apostolic ministry is very important. It continues, but not exactly in the same way. We see, and I think anyone who is honest sees that there is a difference between the apostles that were the disciples of Messiah or saw him personally as Paul did on that road to Damascus and those who are apostles today. Now, it's the same anointing of the Holy Spirit. It is a call, but the position is somewhat different. And the Word of God is going to emphasize their position, their authority, not just in this chapter, but we'll see that in the weeks to come, especially in chapter 8. But let's begin verse 1, Acts chapter 5, verse 1. We read here, And a certain man, Ananias by name, with Shapira his wife, 
they, he sold a parcel. Now, two things are important. First of all, it does not say that they sold, but literally it's in the third person singular, he sold. And notice something else, the type of parcel that he sold. Now, if you could do a good word study of this word, katima, you will find that more often than not, it is related to livestock or cattle or flocks of sheep. And it can mean the cattle themselves, or it can mean the land which they graze upon. We're not talking about agricultural land. We're certainly not talking about a house to live in. But the word here speaks of a field that is used for the purpose of livestock, cattle, flock, that they might graze upon it. Now, there's another important context that we need to remember, and that is last week when we concluded chapter 4, we saw that individuals, and when I say individuals, I'm speaking about fellow believers, that they recognize this apostatic leadership. And therefore, they were moved to be a blessing to others, to follow a Torah lifestyle. And what do I mean by a Torah lifestyle? Well, one of the foundational truths of the Torah is v'ahavta l'areka kamocha, love your neighbor as yourself. So they were operating in love. They took their excess, and I emphasize, but I want to repeat it now. They took what they had in excess, their positions, their, their resources. And they took these possessions and they sold them. Now, they didn't sell everything because if they did and gave all the money away, they themselves would be in need. It's not logical. So they took from their excess and they sold those possessions, that land, whatever it might be. And it's emphasized that they came and they laid those proceeds, that money, at the foot of the apostles, testifying their submissiveness and recognition to this apostolic authority. And now in chapter 5, what we're studying, we see a husband and wife. They were going to do the same thing, but here's a problem. They did not do it according to the truth. And when we don't walk in truth, we don't speak the truth, we are opening ourselves up for satanic influence. And Satan, he is a destroyer. He wants to bring death where Messiah says, I come that you might have life and have it abundantly. So look again at verse 1. And a certain man, Ananias by name, with his wife Shapira, he sold some, some land. And withholding from the value or the worth. Now, this is fine for him to sell something and give a portion, hold something back and give the rest. We'll see this in a few minutes. But the intent of the scripture is that he did something that was not honest, that he gave the impression that he was giving all the value of the land, that he sold it and he gave it all to the apostles. We'll see that in a moment. But in actuality, the first thing that this scripture is saying is that he withheld some for himself. Peter's going to tell us that it's within his right to do so, but he should not mislead or distort or misrepresent that he is giving all of the proceeds instead of just a portion of the proceeds. He needs to do it honestly, according to the truth. So we read here in verse, verse 1, actually verse 2, that he held some back from the proceeds. And then what's emphasized in verse 2, the first word of this sentence is knowing. So she was aware or she was conscious of the fact that he did so. It says, and knowing also his wife. And he brought a 
portion, a certain portion, and at the feet of the apostles, he set it. So he brought a portion, but he misrepresented that portion as the full price. And his wife knew this. So he does what we saw at the end of chapter 4. He takes that in, in a very submissive manner. Outwardly, he lays it. He sets it at the feet of the apostles. Now, word order is important in the new covenant. And what we find here is what's emphasized is that he laid it at the foot of the apostles. And what it literally says, at the feet of the apostles, he sat. Meaning, what's important is not just the giving, but where he gave it. That he gave it to the apostolic ministry. He wanted to further the work of Messiah. And what we're going to find is a very important principle, and that is this, that God's work, Messiah's ministry, is not furthered by deceit. God is never glorified. He is never pleased. It does not assist him whatsoever. When we do something, say something, that is not according to the truth. So what do we find? Well, look now to, to verse 3. And Peter said, and this word and shows a, a contrast. It shows a, a difference. It is to emphasize that Peter, he's going to speak, but in a way that is contrasting to what, what Ananias did. Peter's aware of it because he says, Ananias, on account of what? Now, in the Texas Receptus, what I'm looking, the word is somewhat different from the standard or the more popular Greek text that most English Bibles are translated from. It has an, an additional word to what appears in the normal Greek text that's popular today. And what the Texas Receptus does is that it says, for what reason, on account of what? What was the purpose? However you want to understand it. But it shows that there was something going on in Ananias' thought. A thought that is incorrect. So he says here, look again, middle of verse 3. On account of what? Did Satan fill your heart that you should lie to the Holy Spirit? Here in this chapter, we're going to see that there is an emphasis on the Holy Spirit. He is going to be referred to three different times in three different ways. And the purpose of these differences is to give us a greater understanding of who he is because the Holy Spirit he is working ministering and dwelling in the believers and the authority that Peter has with the other apostles are based upon his anointing and call from the Holy Spirit so once more we read here Peter asks the question he says on account of what What's taking place? What's going on with you? What are you thinking that, that allowed Satan to fill your heart that you should lie to the Holy Spirit and withhold from the value of the land? Now, it's a different words here, and this is why we know that it's talking about a land for the purpose of, of animals grazing upon because the first time it's alluded to, it uses a word that normally speaks of livestock or flocks. But now the second time it's alluded to, it uses a word that speaks of land. So when we put that together, we have a more accurate description. And the reason why I want to emphasize that is it shows how the Word of God takes a point, and it may seem unclear, but when you keep reading, clarity is brought from the text to the text. And that's a very important principle. As we continue to study a passage of Scripture, 
we will find that clarity is brought to the text from the text, meaning as we continue to read, things become clearer. Things are defined in a very precise manner. So Peter is saying here, you know, for what reason did you hold back from the proceeds of the land? Look now to verse 4. He's going to make something very clear. It's what we alluded to earlier. He says, was it not when it remained with you, was it not yours? So when it remained with you, it was yours. And when it was sold, it was still existed to your authority. Now, it's kind of an awkward expression when we translate it literally. But what Peter is saying is, it was your land. You could do what you want with it. And you sold it. And you can do still what you want with those proceeds. He was under no obligation to give the proceeds to the apostles. They weren't asking for it. They weren't demanding it. They had no, what we could say, uh, influence over him that he had to give the full amount. But the problem was, and this is the third time I've said it, the problem is, is that he distorted, he misrepresented what he was doing. He was saying, I'm giving you the full price of the land. Had he said, I'm giving you a third or a half or two-thirds, whatever, that would have been fine. That was a generous thing to do. But when he says, I'm giving you all, but he kept something back, this is a lie. It is not according to truth, and when we live according to the lie, we're going to see the purposes of the enemy is going to be realized in our life rather than the purposes of God. Look now to the middle of verse 4. He says, Because of what did you set your heart to this thing? Now, what he's saying here in the scripture, when we look at it carefully in the Greek, and the word this thing, the word this is there, but the word thing is the word pragma. And that word pragma is something that is pragmatic. And here's what it's trying to refer to us. When we set our heart in a certain way, and this is what Peter's saying, why did you set your heart according to deceitfulness? That which is not accurate because you heart, because your heart was not set properly. Therefore, this is the natural outcome, the pragmatic thing that is going to stem from it. So this scripture is instructing the believer that we need to set our heart properly to put it in the right condition. And there's numerous scriptures that teach us what we need to do, how we need to behave, what should be our objectives in order that God gives us the desires of our heart, that he places the right desires within our heart. Ananias was not doing that. And notice what he says, that is Peter at the end, of, of this passage, he says, because your heart was not set right and that you did this thing, he says, you have not lied to man or literally to men, but to God. Now, this is very important. And one of the reasons that we go through the scripture verse by verse is because it can help us learn how to interpret the word of God. Earlier, it says here that, that Ananias, Peter is speaking, and he says that you've lied to who? Well, go back up to the scripture. We see at the end of verse 3 that you have lied to the Holy Spirit. But now in, in the next verse, verse 4, Peter's saying you haven't lied to men, but you've lied to God. And when we put those two statements together, that you've lied to the Holy Spirit and that you've lied to God, you know what we derive from that? We can see the divinity of the Holy Spirit. 
And the only way that we can speak of that is in the theological term Trinity. Now, people will say, you know, the Trinities, that word doesn't appear in the Bible. That's true. But the concept, what the doctrine of the Trinity teaches is many places in the Word of God. And this is one. The Scripture is laying a foundation that, that Ananias lied to the Holy Spirit, and now it says he's lied to God. And the only conclusion is the Holy Spirit, he is God. And we don't have two gods, but we have one God. And the Trinity does not speak about multiple gods. It speaks about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three distinct persons, but one God. And they are not parts of one God. Individually, they are God. Meaning the Holy Spirit, He is divine, He is God. Yeshua, He is God. And God the Father, He's God. But once again, three equals one, one equals three. It is wrong to look at the Trinity and speak of multiple gods. There's only one. Now, I realize that that is hard to grasp, but we're dealing with God. Anything that we learn about God's nature is going to be hard for a human mind to grasp. But this is what the Scripture's revealing. So Peter says, you haven't lied to men, but you've lied to God. Verse, verse 5. And Ananias hearing. And what's very important is this participle hearing is in the present. What we find is that there is a immediate judgment. There is an immediate response. When Ananias learned that he lied to God, what happened? Well, when he heard this, that is, when he heard these words, he fell, here again, immediately, and he expired. Now, that word means to breathe out. And what it teaches is death, biblically, is when the spirit of a man or a spirit of a woman exits that body. And when the spirit leaves, exits, that person is going to be physically dead. Physical death is not the same thing as spiritual death. Perhaps some other time we'll talk about spiritual death, which is simply eternal separation from God in a place of eternal condemnation and punishment in the lake that burns forever with fire and brimstone. So look once more. Ananias, when hearing these words, he falls and expired. He breathed his last. And notice the outcome. Second part of verse, verse 5. And it came about great fear. Now, that fear is for the purpose of priority. Because of this event, all those who heard these things, they gave God priority. They had a proper, what's said in Hebrew, Yerat Hashemayim, a proper fear of God. Now, here in the scripture, one of the things that the book of Acts does is that the book of Acts shows us a very kingdom presentation of God and his people. Things happen immediately. Now, in the dispensation that we live in, that is the time epoch, we don't always see the, the immediate results. And the reason for that is for repentance. God is gracious. He's long-suffering. He is, is extending his mercy for the purpose of repentance. But at this time, the Holy Spirit moved in a very mighty, invisible way. And I'm not saying that he doesn't move that way today. But, but not with the frequency that we see during this apostolic time period. Now, someone's going to hear that and ask me a question, so I'm going to answer it right now. Do I believe in the gifts of the spirits? Yes, I do. All of them? Yes, I do. Do I believe even today that, that through the anointing of the Spirit, people can be healed? Yes, I do. Risen from the dead? Yes, I do. But it is not with the same frequency, for whatever reason, 
as we saw during the apostolic time. That means during the time of the disciples, those 11 disciples and the additional one, Matthias, and also what we see in Paul and those others that, that ministered in the book of Acts. There's differences. Why that is, I have no answer. But what I can say is the book of Acts emphasizes this apostolic authority. Look again at the text. And it came about in the verse 5. Great fear upon all the ones who have heard these things. Verse 6. And the young men standing, they did something. They and it might say in your Bible, covered. But what it speaks of is them preparing Ananias for burial, preparing his body, wrapping him up as was the tradition of the Jewish community at that time and in many places, still the tradition of the Jewish community. So they, they prepared him and carried and buried. So they carried him to the place where they buried him. And this also shows a, a connection with the Torah. When we look, for example, in the book of Genesis and the death of Sarah, we see that there was an emphasis by Avraham to put the dead out of sight. The emphasis in Judaism is a quick burial. And we see that being affirmed in a very powerful way here in chapter 5. Because Ananias was buried and his wife wasn't even there. And that may be odd in a modern day way of thinking, but not at that time. Burying the dead is of the utmost importance and it takes precedence over all things. It's only after the burial does the mourning begin. Well, look if you would to verse 7. And it came about as three hours afterwards. So from the time of this event, when Ananias died after hearing the truth and being carried away, approximately three hours had passed. Why three? Well, the number three is for the purpose of revealing something or documenting something. And that's exactly what we're going to see. So three hours afterwards, we find also his wife. She did not know the event, what had happened, and she entered. So she comes before Peter. She comes into this same place wherever they were. She enters in, verse 8. And Peter answers her. That is, he's responding to this issue. And he says, say to me, if such and such, the field was purchased. Now, he uses a different word. When we go back earlier in the text, we find a different word in the Bible for selling. Here, we find the word apodidomi. Apodidomi, which is appearing in verse 8, it is a word which speaks apo, meaning from, and the word didomi, given. So what was given that this price, this parcel of land might come from them, might be sold, might go away from their possessions? It's a very specific term, where earlier on it was general. So here Peter is being specific. So he says, if such and such was given, for the land and her response middle of verse 8 and she said yes such and such now this word that i translate such and such is a specific it's to bring a specificity to the text he says tell me is this the price it was such and such given she says yes such and such was given using very detailed language and this is because the truth should always be detailed and notice what happens look at verse 9 and Peter said to her 
Because of why have you agreed or conspired together? Why have you conspired together? And notice what it says, to test the spirit of the Lord. Now, this is the third time that the Holy Spirit is being referred to in this passage. The first time, he's called the Holy Spirit. The second time, he is mentioned as God. And now, the third time, the Spirit of the Lord, and most scholars would say that this Lord would be referring to Yeshua himself. So we have the Holy Spirit standing individually. We have the Holy Spirit in light of God, meaning God the Father. And now we have the Holy Spirit in light of the Spirit of the Lord, Yeshua. And all of this speaks in order to give us a better understanding of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's an additional reason why it says the Spirit of the Lord and not the Spirit of Yeshua. It is to emphasize this lordship. It is only when we recognize the lordship of Yeshua that the Holy Spirit, that he is going to be functioning powerfully, mightily in our life. It's when you recognize his lordship that you will not be quenching or grieving the Holy Spirit. And foundational, what's being said? Well, we need to remember that when Yeshua spoke of the Holy Spirit, he called him the spirit of truth. And in this passage, it's speaking to us that when we walk in truth, the spirit is going to function mightily. He is going to minister to us. He is going to give us revelation. He is going to give us and equip us to what we need to serve him. But when we hinder that Holy Spirit, we speak in truth, we behave deceitfully, we distort and misrepresent. Well, the outcome is Satan is going to bring about his desire, which is, as we spoke about, which is not life but death. Look again, verse 9. And Peter said to her, on account of why, literally, because of what? Have you conspired together, agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of the ones who buried your husband are at the door and they carry you. That is, they're going to carry you as well. Look at verse 10. And she falls immediately at his feet. Now, what's being emphasized is this place at his feet, the feet of the apostles. And it's speaking here that they have a dual role. That is to minister, that is to receive in order to bless, to meet needs, but also they have an authority that when they are challenged, when they are lied to, they are going to bring about judgment. And that's why she dies at that location at his feet. And she breathed her last. She expired. Now, the language is very similar to her husband's death. And it's just to show us that God is a God of equality. A man lies he's going to be punished. A woman lies, she's going to be punished. And the punishment of one is going to be the punishment of the other. God is not a respecter of people. He has equality. So she dies in an equal manner to her husband. It says, and the young ones, these same group of young men, they entering in found her dead. And they carried and buried, meaning her, near her husband. So they were partners in a marriage. That is, the two becomes one. And when they are partners in deceit, they are going to suffer that same, that one consequence. And when we live according to the father of lies, we're going to experience the judgment that Satan's going to receive and that is of death. 
So she's buried near her husband. One more verse, and we'll conclude. Look at verse 11. And it came about, this is the second time, but notice, it begins the same way as we see in verse 5, but there's a different ending. And what is that, and why is that? That's what we're going to talk about. Look at verse 11. And it came about great fear upon all the congregation. Now, this fear, here again, is giving God priority. It is a fear that leads to submissiveness. It is not a fear. Let me give an example. Sometimes something is fearful, and what do people do? They flee. But this is not a fear that causes one to flee. It is a fear that causes one to obey or submit or to draw closer to God through obedience. So it's giving God's priority into putting it into our lives where we're going to reflect it. And this is the description of the ecclesia, the church of God, that we walk in fear. And that fear, that priority that we have for God is going to cause us not to deceive, not to distort, not to lie. And this event was so powerful, notice what it says, that this great fear also was upon all the ones hearing these things. So even those who are not part of the congregation, they could not deny when they heard these things and they saw the burial places, they heard the testimony, it also made an impression upon them. So God's truth is mighty to bring about change. Change in believers first, and that change is going to have an impact upon others. Here again, when we look at this text, what we see is we see the significance of the apostolic ministry being given and manifested first to the body of believers and then to the rest. And why is that? Because in the end, it is going to be the leaders of God that are going to inherit and rule the world. And this is just a foreshadowing of that, that which is to come in the kingdom dispensation. The establishment of the kingdom will be orchestrated in this manner. Well, we'll close with that. Until next week, may God richly bless you. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.